Okay, so I think we're ready to go, if you're ready. I am, I'll just uh, start sharing and... Um... Very good. So, um, uh, welcome everybody to uh, the next ECB COVID-19 webinar. Uh, today, it's our great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Martin Eichenbaum. He's a professor of economics at Northwestern University, uh, and he's a leading uh, macroeconomist. Um, he has um, actually uh, produced already a paper on the pandemic, um, and today he will give a sort of a macroeconomic perspective on the pandemic. And um, I can take questions from you if you use your chat button. And I also ask all of you to mute so that there is uh, no background noise. And with that, over to Martin. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, it, it's a pleasure. Uh, this is a, a joint research project with uh, Sergio Ribello and uh, Matthias Trabant, um, who is a, a young co-author that you should know about if you don't. Um, let me begin to say that uh, obviously governments were all struggling with uh, understanding the epidemic and trying to uh, manage it. And uh, our basic tool, I think when we all started off, are epidemiological models, which uh, are, are can be extremely useful, no question about it. But there's an important caveat to their use that struck us as, as macroeconomists, is that those models don't allow for the interaction between economic decisions and rates of infection. So for example, um, the epidemic naturally causes a recession, as we'll see, as uh, people uh, shop and, and work less to reduce the chances of getting infected. But of course, uh, the number of people that are working or shopping influences uh, the rate at, at which infections spread. And uh, those are effects simply not allowed for in, in standard models, which can be very rich in other dimensions, but not on this one. Um, so in our model, the, the way uh, a macroeconomist thinks about it, an epidemic has both an aggregate demand effect and an aggregate supply effect. So the supply effect is pretty straightforward. An epidemic exposes people who are working to the virus and uh, people react to that risk very naturally by reducing their labor supply. So that's the supply effect, if you like. But there's also a demand effect, which is people, the epidemic exposes people who are purchasing uh, consumption goods uh, to the virus, and they naturally respond to that by uh, reducing their consumption. So both uh, the supply and demand effects work together to generate a very large and, in principle, persistent recession. Now, with that said, the, there is a classic externality that arises when you think about uh, an infection. We call it, it's an infection externality, which is people who are infected with the virus simply don't internalize the effect of their consumption and work decisions um, on the spread of the virus. And I remember speaking to a journalist early on, and he said, oh, it's like pollution. And I said, that's exactly right. Uh, as economists, we understand that, that externality. And most of us are very comfortable with the idea of taxing uh, such an externality. So that leads to the question, okay, well, which policies uh, should the government pursue uh, to deal with that externality? Well, you can break up the classes of uh, policies we've thought of, and I'll give you obvious extensions that we're working on now. The first I would say is simple containment, and we model that in a variety of ways, but those are policies that <clears throat> reduce consumption and hours worked in ways that don't condition on people's health status or demographic status or things of that nature. So they're relatively brute force. Um, and in our model, you'll see they're effective, <clears throat> but they're, they're certainly very costly. There's another class of um, uh, policies, which I'll call smart containment, which does treat people differently according to their health status. And the way we analyze it, you'll see it's almost aspirational in the sense that it requires to implement a great deal of uh, technology, which quite frankly, we don't have. Uh, but it, so I really think of it as uh, saying, look, if you had that technology, it's dramatically better than simple containment uh, because you could basically uh, manage to deal with the epidemic without a severe recession and without a large number of deaths. So it really says the returns to developing that technology are extremely large. We're currently working on an extension of the model that I'll talk about today, 
which allows for type one and type two errors, both in testing for infections and uh, for, for uh, people that are recovered. If there's time, we can come back to that at the end. Uh, look, we're gonna use a pretty simple model because we started off on this. And uh, that means there's a lot of important epidemic policy related issues that we're simply not ready to talk about yet. So for example, um, just plain humanitarian uh, uh, issues like many people uh, are losing their jobs, they're uh, constrained in their ability to borrow, and for lots of reasons we'd want to help them. The the uh, liquidity issues, which of course uh, the Federal Reserve has been quite terrific on, and, and hopefully the ECB as well. Um, but I want to stress another thing that uh, a CEO of a, of, of a major bank and I were talking about, and he said the way he thought about the uh, the virus and policy was yes of course there's the short run effects but there's a bridge we need to somehow find a bridge to the after and the problem is we don't quite know how long the bridge has to be uh, but there's an awful lot of human capital and uh, uh, firm capital that we don't want destroyed and we need to think of policies to uh, to deal with that. that. That's something I think is easy, we all agree on, but of course, God is in the details and uh, that's not what we're gonna talk about today. We also abstract from nominal rigidities. Question? Martin, this, uh, yeah, one question. Um, so far, seems to me that what you have in mind is a negative externality from the virus. Um, yes. Is it possible that there are could be a positive externality if it is indeed true as you were just saying that the virus may reappear i mean we we sort of don't know and um, maybe is actually there maybe there's actually a positive externality by uh, everybody staying at home if indeed it prevents us from having future outbreaks we sort of don't know how these curves uh, really look like right what's the optimal I think what, what it seems to me or what you're assuming is that there is sort of a, a one-off shock or not. Uh, no, we, we will have an endogenous, uh, that is to say, there'll, there'll be an epidemic, there'll be dynamics. Uh, certainly staying at home and social containment is part of what we call either simple or smart containment. So I, I, I completely agree that we, as we'll get to, when we get to the policy part, we need to build up herd containment, you know, absent a vaccine. And now the question becomes, what's the optimal way to do that? And all the models that I'll talk about today, I think share your intuition that we want people staying at home or minimizing their contact uh, for a certain amount of period. And so I certainly want to talk about all the issues that, that you've just raised. So I, I don't think we disagree. So maybe we can, if that's okay, circle back in just a few moments. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, the the robust central message uh, really uh, that I want to stress is absent smart. Action and the health consequences of the epidemic and uh, clever policy. Off as tolerable as possible from a social perspective. Okay. Let me tell you where we start off, and by now, this is perhaps it was an obscure model, uh, the uh, the classic series on Craig Burnside many years ago used this model to talk about housing, in which you talk about the way information is spread and and sentiment. Uh, so we kind of knew the model, and and uh, came about this horrible event. I tried to apply it to study this event. So this really goes back to a classic paper by Kermack and McKendrick. And to stress, they have exogenous transition probabilities between population, some measure, let's call it one for the sake of argument. Um, and we're going to divide the population into four groups. They're going to be uh, folks called susceptible. They haven't yet been exposed to the disease. They're affected. There's a measure IT of those people. There's a fraction RT that are recovered and sadly a fraction DT that are deceased. Now, for today, I want to talk about uh, the case in which people know their health status. We have recently solved the model in which people don't know their health status. And it turns out for the issues that I'll talk about today, I have a graph at the end if people are very curious. It doesn't make much of a difference 
for the set of issues that I'm talking about today. For other issues, it may. So just as a polar case, it's simpler to deal with. Everybody knows what they are, although obviously in reality they don't. I'm going to ascribe preferences so that we can be concrete. I'm going to imagine that prior to the epidemic, people are identical and they care about their consumption, their you know, log CT, and they dislike working, uh, and here's N squared T. Uh, we, we can make this much more realistic on a lot of dimensions, but for the main ideas, this will be easy. This household, to emphasize um, capital, physical capital, it, it comp complicates the model. We want this to be pretty painful for individuals cutting back work. And so for right now, we're gonna abstract from capital. Um, and so people are gonna have wage earnings, they're gonna have consumption. And there's a question of how it is that the government is going to uh, implement uh, containment policies. There's, let me call it a mathematical trick that I associate with Fari and Warning who talked about capital controls. And they imagined uh, a shadow variable, let's call it um, a mu CT, which is sort of a, a quasi tax on consumption or a wedge on consumption. Um, the any proceeds from which are rebated uh, to uh, the household lump sum. Now, to be clear, that's not the way containment occurs. So we also solved a version in which the government simply tells all people what their consumption would be and their hours work would be. So there's no revenues, there's no taxes, and you get very similar results. And again, I'll actually show you that graph a little bit later on. But for programming for right now, let me just think of uh, mu CT as the containment rate. And this is the uh, the setting. A very, very simple model. Uh, consumption is uh, linear. It's produced by a linear technology and a government has a simple budget constraint and that's that. Uh, since we wrote this paper, people have allowed for lots of extensions of different consumption, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we've solved the model for a new Keynesian version of the model in which there's sticky prices. I won't talk about that today because I, I truly don't think it's central to the issues for today. This is a, an important slide uh, because it really highlights uh, in many ways what the value added, if any, of our paper is relative to the standard models. Think of cap T as being the number of newly infected people in society. Um, the way the epidemiologists would have thought about this is that you have a measure of, of susceptible people, ST, who meet with a measure of infected people. And there's some parameter, let's call it pi. Those meetings translate into uh, new infections. If you actually speak to the epidemiologist, they're very, very good about breaking this function into great micro details. So you can talk about workers versus students, et cetera. Um, so, you know, that's a level of detail, which we don't get into at this level, but think of this as sort of non-economic interactions. It's sort of just exogenous. Now, of course, in the real world, people go to work, right? And it's a purposeful decision. And so think of the total number of infected people, IT, and the total number of infected people, let's call it the hours that they work. So this is the measure of uh, infected people, that the effective people that are, are at work. If you're a susceptible person, you're working NS hours, think of matching or meeting these people, and those meetings translate into um, via this parameter, uh, a, a, a newly infected, uh, new infections. We'll talk about the calibration a little bit. Um, but similarly on consumption, uh, there's going to be a variety of infected people who are consuming. So think of this as the total hours or measure of how much they're, they're consuming. And you as a sep the susceptible people are meeting with um, uh, uh, and are shopping and you will meet with these people and that too will result in infections. It's obviously true in the real world, there are different kinds of consumption activities which are more or less time intensive. So, you know, my son tells me going to a rock concert, I'm too old for these things, is much more time intensive and there are more people than um, other activities like takeout food. So again, there are extensions of this model now which allow uh, for the, that kind of heterogeneity. On accounting, so the number of susceptible people at time T is ST, new people will be infected. So you exit from susceptible and you become uh, you, from the stock, um, 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 let's say you're becoming infected. And so susceptible T plus one is susceptible T minus new infections. 
the number of infected people at T plus one, well, you start off with a certain number of infected people. There will be new entrants of infected people. How do people exit from uh, infected state? Well, there's two ways. There's the good way, the happy way. There's some probability pi r that you become um, 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 uh, recovered. So that's what the r means. And there's some probability pi d that uh, you uh, unfortunately uh, pass away. Now we've made this geometric. It, it probably isn't geometric. We can put in arbitrary probabilities. And again, today for simplicity, I'll just make these geometric. This, this will come back later when we talk about uh, vaccines. The number of recovered people at time t, rt, and uh, you're going to have new infected people, a fraction pi r of the infected become recovered, and so that's why this is t plus 1. And as an accounting matter, we have the number of deceased. Uh, there's some stock of uh, um, uh, deceased individuals, uh, and pi d uh, of infected people die. Note one thing we are not allowing for, which would be quite catastrophic in reality if it's true. if um, People recover and can then become infected again. Uh, that has very dire implications uh, in, in this model. Um, so we are not considering that possibility. We can put that into the model, but it was our judgment that um, that's not something we want to emphasize right now. If it's really true, we are in not in good shape. Uh, so Mart Martin, um, this is Luke again. Um, that was sort of what my earlier question was hinting at. So yesterday we actually had a very gloomy outlook painted to us by an epidemiologist, uh, Harvard University, um, who just published a, a, an article in Science where indeed the prediction is that we should count on recurrent outbreaks and that immunity builds up very slowly indeed over time and is not permanent. So in that sense, there, there seems to be a lot of uncertainty around whether the one-off lockdown is actually successful and is even the right thing to do. Um, it complicates matters quite a bit. So that's why I'm, I'm saying, um, you know, with pollution, pollution is always bad in our models, but in this case, maybe depending on how these dynamics work out and whether people recover permanently or not, uh, sort of may, 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 you may end up in a much uh, worse state than uh, what you have right now in the model. Right, I, 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 so I would agree with that, uh, but B, I would say that the, uh, the message of smart containment, so containment certainly will be important, but that will raise even more the stakes on what we call smart containment as a, uh, a socially bearable way to deal with uh, infections. So I, I would, you know, so maybe, I, so I agree. B, I would say yes, that even, so that makes even more importance to this issue of smart containment. So again, we'll, we'll come back to that because it's obviously a very, very important issue. I don't disagree at all. Okay, in the model, as you all know, in these models, you start with some seed, a fraction epsilon of susceptible people is infected. Um, it can be person to person, it can be zoonotic, which I gather is cross species. This is something my, my colleague Rebello taught me. So there's epsilon that are infected and one minus epsilon are unaffected. Here for the heroics, uh, we're assuming agents are aware of the initial infection, which is not true, and they understand the loss of motion governing population health dynamics, which is most certainly not true. So robustness at a minimum becomes very important in this kind of analysis. This last bullet, though, I think is definitely true for almost all of us, which is all agents will take as given aggregate variables. That is to say, whatever I do, it's not going to affect how many aggregate infected people there are, aggregate consumption of infected people, and aggregate uh, hours worked of infected people. Okay. Very quickly on the utility functions, just so people understand the problems that in the basic model, let me, and then I'll show you the complications. In the simplest model, um, the lifetime utility of a susceptible person, what is that? Well, they have a period utility function. They care about their consumption, their hours worked. But from their personal point of view, with some probability, one minus ta, they will not get infected. If they're not infected, they'll be susceptible. And this is the value function of a susceptible person tomorrow. With some probability, they will get infected, sadly, and then they will have the value function of an infected person. 
what do I as an individual perceive that my individual probability will become infected? Well, I may interact with an infected person and there's some parameter there. If I go to work, uh, there's a bunch of infected people that are I might bump into. That's this IT, NIT, and here's how much time I spend at work. And this is this parameter governing that. Similarly, if I go shopping, uh, there's a bunch of people that are shopping. If I go shopping, that's what the little c is, then they may get infected. Of course, in equilibrium, this little Tom, my personal perception of the probability of him being infected is the same as the aggregate law of motion for the number of people getting infected. So that's the, the heroic rational expectations. One thing that is true is that when I think of my probabilities, I only think of the action that I take and how that affects that probability. I do not take into effect how, and each person doesn't take into effect how these aggregates are being affected by their individual actions. So that's the, if you like, the externality. There's a budget constraint, uh, which is straightforward. Um, so we have that. Now, if you're an infected person, and this is important. Martin, sorry, Martin, sorry to interrupt. There are a couple of questions on, on of course. this part. Of course. So, um, two related questions from, from Gabriel Perez Quiros and Florian Heider. Um, so, um, how important is the assumption you're making that the probability of recovery is exogenous? Um, should not this depend on the number of people? that we can uh, absorb in intensive care. Excellent. Um, and will this add another dimension to externalities? And related to that, um, it seems that many of the containment policies were exactly motivated by capacity constraints in the health system. Is this unique this time? And what does it mean for your model so, setup? I absolutely agree. And we do allow for that. That's what I meant by the simple model. So in about two slides, I'm going to get to exactly this issue, critical issue of the healthcare system and overwhelming it. So just give me two slides, but A, I agree, B, it's very important, and C, it's in the model. Um, and you know, as far as generic epidemics, let me let me be eclectic on that. Um, I think this is such a massive infection that I, I don't know that I want to extrapolate. Uh, you can imagine any widespread episode would, would threaten the healthcare system, and it is very important. So give me two slides, and I promise you I'll get to there, or a few slides. Um, but let's think about the infected people because there's going to be a very important issue that comes up here. And that is, um, first, people do care about their period consumption and work. An infected person, he may, he or she may be infected next period. Uh, <clears throat> and if they are, how do you get, you're infected, it means you, God forbid, you didn't die and you recovered. So one minus pi r minus pi d, you're infected. With probability pi r, you are recovered. Okay. Now, what if you don't recover and you die? Well, the standard assumption in the health literature is that the value of death is zero, or if you like the opportunity cost of living. There is a very important issue, which I'll come to, which is implicitly what is the value of life, because that does affect people's decisions and, of course, policy. And we're going to do it, as you'll see later on, for the standard uh, U.S. value, um, which is very arguable, but it's based on the micro literature, people like Kip Viscusi and others. Uh, it's about 9.2 million. Now, this model doesn't have age heterogeneity, and so you're lumping together old and young people. And so we're also going to go to another extreme, which emphasizes young people and think of the value of life as being 1.5 million. And you'll see that some numbers change, but nothing qualitative. The way you vary that in this model is just by the discount rate you can basically control in terms of what does the model say the value of life is with apologies to the to the ethicist uh, by controlling beta okay we're also going to assume that um, uh, people who are infected are not as as not as productive at work and uh, that's a subparameter phi i uh, of course in reality there's two types of infected people they're symptomatic and asymptomatic and so we're going to calibrate this phi or think of this phi as reflecting an average between those people Recovered people are very simple. Uh, they're always recovered, so which was goes back to some point we raised before. Here's their period consumption, but tomorrow they're going to be recovered for sure, and so we just start the recursion that way. 
The government's very simple. Uh, they are basically in the in the simplest form of containment. They are handing out uh, lump sum payments uh, to all the different kinds of people in society. How do they get stuff here? Uh, they basically get the containment tax, if you like. As I say, that you, I certainly don't want to take this literally, and I'm very happy that the alternative way of modeling it gives us virtually similar results, very similar results. Okay. To the healthcare issue that uh, a gentleman raised, uh, very important. We all understand that if the healthcare system uh, uh, will deteriorate if substantial fracture of the population becomes infected. So how did we model that? Well, a very simple way to model it is that the probability of death is some say pi d, but then is increasing in the fraction of the population that's infected. So we have this non -con this uh, convex function which basically says the probability of death goes up, and that's a stand-in for lack of ventilators, for lack of beds, et cetera, et cetera. So this parameter, as you'll see, certainly uh, has a very important effect on absolute consequences of the infection, and, uh, and, and uh, certainly policy in our model depends very much on that kappa. Okay, we also are gonna allow for treatments. What are treatments? Well, here, uh, we imagine that there's uh, an effective treatment that cures infected people, and it arrives with probability delta C per period. Think of it as sort of Calvo-esque. Um, um, now, we understand that in reality, there's not as, you know, in reality, we know that the treatments aren't going to happen for a while, and then the probabilities are going to go up. We solve the model, have solved the model, allowing in the other way. This turns out to be prettier and easier uh, to talk about. So, you know, you can just govern, uh, think of Delta C, you know, if you want it to be once, you know, the expected arrival time of two years, one year, three years, that that's something that can be varied. How would you modify the problem? Well, we're running a little short of time. So let me just say, if you're an infected person before you could either just uh, get in, um, you have to allow for uh, the fact that the treatment arrives. Once a treatment arrives, an infected person has effectively recovered. So that's what this little red node on the far right hand represents. This node is what happens when treatment doesn't arrive. And it's just like we spoke about before. So it, it gets more complicated with treatments. Vaccinations, which we're all very uh, hoping for. This is a vaccination against uh, infections, and it too will arrive in a Calvo-like way with probability delta V. And again, one can feed in, you know, zero arrival rates for a year, which then go up dramatically. Uh, that, that, that's just a model solution thing, doesn't change anything first order. How does that change things? Well, it changes for the susceptible, right? A vaccine isn't gonna help an infected person. They unfortunately, uh, can only be helped by treatment. But a susceptible person now with probability delta V, they're going to become like a recovered person because if the treatment, if the vaccine is effective, that's it, you're done. Uh, delta V, one minus delta V, you're just like you were before and you have to cycle through the normal state of affairs. Let me briefly talk about parameter values because as we all know, there's enormous uncertainty about many of the parameters. And we kind of did the best that we could and tried to do as much robustness checks as possible. So I'll just, let me just say that. This is a weekly model. And in this initial attempt, we uh, said that it takes on average 18 days to recover or die from an infection. Uh, that's arguable. This parameter is quite important, is important for governing the time to a peak infection in a competitive equilibrium. So as I, as uh, if you like, it's related to this, this notion of R, R not, but uh, the, our initial thing was 18. We have, I can tell you numbers later for peak infection time, if it's five days, which uh, some people, I think that's a little too, op quite optimistic. Uh, and we could talk about 10, but th there's no discontinuity there. Mortality rates, very interesting and, and difficult to measure. How do we do this? Well, the best testing in the world so far has been South Korea, as far as we know, or at least initially it was. Um, so we looked at mortality rates by age in South Korea. And then because we're Americans, uh, we were thinking of America, we said, well, what if Americans by age had Korean mortality rates, but our demographic structure? And when we do that, we get a number that's roughly 0.5. I mean, you can argue it's 0.4, of course, and you can argue it's 0.6, but our age-adjusted mortality rates using South Korean data is on the order of magnitude of 
Could this be wrong? Absolutely. Uh, but we think it's still a reasonable uh, number given the scientific evidence. And then you can translate that into this parameter, bearing in mind it's weeks and bearing in mind this 18 number. Uh, initial infected, you know, so with some seed, uh, we parameterize parameterize the, cat, the uh, numbers A and theta. A, remember, is productivity. Theta is the disutility of labor. So that before the epidemic, people are working about 28 hours a week, and they earn an average weekly income of 58,000 divided by 52, which is the number for the U.S. Very important, beta, 0.96 to the 1 over 52. Why? We choose that so that the value of a life is $9.3 million 2019 dollars, in the pre-epidemic steady state, as I said, that corresponds to what the EPA and other US government agencies use. Um, very important to vary, especially in a simple model like this, where we don't have heterogeneity with respect to age. Um, so I will most definitely, I hope, show you the numbers if this is 1.5 million, and you'll see that uh, the patterns are certainly the same, if not the exact numbers. Transmission function, I'll be brief, but I owe you an explanation. Um, here, the, the ep epidemiologists are very good about looking at different modes of transmission in respiratory diseases, right? So they'll look at a previous disease and say, well, you know, how was it transmitted? And according to Ferguson et al., um, about 30% occurs in the household. 33% occur in the general community and 30% occur in schools and workplaces. So the first thing we did was we said, well, let's go look at this general community and ask how much time, because it's not expenditures, it's time, right? So how much time in this category of general community services is devoted to consumption? So that gives us some knowledge about, um, uh, I'll show you how we impose the restriction. On the uh, fraction of transmissions in the workplace, we don't wanna treat workers and students identically, and the reason is that the epidemiologists tell us that the average number of daily contacts is much higher in school than in the workplace. So we look at a weighted average of workers and students and get that information. If you do that, then we're gonna use three restrictions to pin down these three parameters, pies. The first is that evaluated at pre-epidemic steady state values, about one sixth of infections are gonna occur via consumption. That's how the numbers translate quite miraculously. One sixth occur roughly in the workplace. Now we need one more restriction. And here we decided to go to the lower end of uh, a Chancellor Merkel's scenario, which is you recall, I'm sure in, in uh, the second week in March, uh, she uh, in her speech said, well, we think about 60% of the population will either recover from the infection or die. Again, this is an easy parameter to change and all the software is online and, and we can talk about sensitivity to that particular parameter. But if you think of the 1, 6, 1, 6, and 60, we have three parameters and three unknowns. We can back out uh, the pies and that's how we transmit the transmission function. Okay, so let's get to some results to make sure uh, we- Martin, yeah, yes. thanks. Before showing the, these uh, fascinating results, there are two more clarifying questions on the setup. Mm -hmm. So one is by Carlos Montes Galdon uh, asking whether the pi three in your SIR model yes. uh, would also be affected by containment policies. Uh, no. So that's that's an excellent um, no. In in fact, the containment in our model is going to work through n through work and public consumption. Uh, there, there is, we do not affect uh, directly um, pi, uh, we do not infect this third class of interactions. And, and that's why you may have to have, a, you'll see, a, quite a severe recession. So that's a very sharp question, and, and it's a good one. Uh, we, we, uh, you could argue that, you know, maybe that's too, uh, too pessimistic, right? And that you could extend this uh, to uh, somehow affecting the interactions that people have in a non-work and a non-consumption venue. A really good question. Yeah, that, that, that was what the question was aiming at. And the other question from Klaus Masuch is, uh, you mentioned heterogeneity between young and old. Correct. Um, how would the value of life in your model depend on remaining life expectancy without having the, uh, the virus? 
Oh, absolutely. Well, so you you obviously uh, well, so we can go to the micro literature and and here I want to be a little bit crass and you know we're economists and uh, with all the appropriate caveats to the to, to, to the ethicists. Um, in strict economic terms, an eighty year old has less quote value uh, of a statistical life than a twenty five year old. Um, and so you have two choices then as a modeler. Uh, one is to say like Victor Rios rule, you simplify on a lot of dimensions about the dynamic choices of people and you allow for a lot of heterogeneity, right? That's one way to go. The other is what we've done in this initial draft, which is to say, let's just say as a weighted average, should we go with the younger person, the older person, the 9.3 of the government is supposed to be a representative number. Uh, but of course, you know, that's, that representative is always a difficult uh, thing in these contexts. Um, that's why we went with the 1.5 million, which would skew uh, to the disease hitting disproportionately older people. I think is, is, is the short answer to the question. Is that, is that okay? Yes, uh, no, that's okay for now. Great. Okay. Yeah, and I agree, it would be better to have uh, you know, an overlapping generations model, but you can imagine if you start to have substand. Now, I'll come back to this uh, age thing because it does matter a little bit for testing and, and that's on and in our ongoing work. Okay, so let's look at, I'm, I'm going to present the basic results. I first want to show you a version of the model in which there's no medical preparedness, so you can't overwhelm the system, and then the no vaccinations and no treatments, just so it's the simplest possible model to display uh, what's going on. What is, first of all, what would an epidemiologist say? Well, you could think of what an epidemiologist say, is doing is saying that people's consumption and labor decisions aren't endogenous. So let's just fix them at their steady state value and see what effect that would have on the economy. The key thing that I wanna show you here is you would get um, a, um, a, a relatively, um, uh, that's the dotted line, and you would get a pretty big infection, right, and many, many deaths. What does endogenizing, oh, and by the way, the, you would get a very mild recession. Uh, why do you get any recession? Well, because A, infected people, as I said, aren't quite as productive as non-infected people, so as more of the population gets infected, they're less productive. And unfortunately, in steady state, you will have deaths, and so that would affect total G consumption, but not per capita. What does endogenizing work choices and consumption do in this model? Well, people are really afraid of getting sick, and uh, they're really going to cut back on their work, and they're really going to cut back on their hours. And notice how much bigger the recession is, uh, the solid blue line, than than the dotted line, which is to say, taking into account economics, you get a much bigger recession. What is the plus associated with this sharp contraction? Well, deaths in the blue line are lower than deaths in the dotted line. So people are willingly, see, it's a funny shock. Most shocks in economics, we like to think people like to smooth consumption. Here, it's just the opposite. People respond to the shock by lowering consumption. And so the average contraction in the simple model is about five and a half percent over the first year, which we initially thought was, gee, that seems big. But as you'll see, well, as you know, uh, is kind of not, it may be too small. We can talk about that. Now, you can imagine that now the government says we just have simple containment policies. And so we're going to impose one, quote, tax on consumption. This is the pattern that the optimal containment policy would take. It would initially be small, which is not the prediction that we have because we don't have other the, the vaccinations in here. You would basically, initially, there's not much of an externality because there aren't many infected people in the beginning of the epidemic. As the epidemic gets bigger, you the externality gets bigger, and so the containment gets bigger. So that's why the uh, rise in the dotted line and... Um, and notice that, of course, as you make the tax bigger, you get a much bigger uh, fall in consumption. Uh, notice that the, uh, the, the uh, dotted line now is how the economy behaves under optimal containment, much bigger uh, recession. Uh, 
And also notice that the benefit is that you substantially reduce deaths um, um, over time because you've contracted the economy more than the competitive equilibrium would have done on its own. How would uh, adding a, a lower value of life affect things? So obviously an important question. So if instead of doing the exercise I just did for 9.5 million, I think, and I did it for 1.5 million, you can see a very similar pattern emerges. Uh, however, uh, the amount that you would intervene is lower. Um, why? Because the quote value of the externality taking into account the value of life is lower. But please note that you would still get you would still get a very substantial increase um, in the tax and a very substantial recession as a result of it. Right. So, but the numbers are smaller. You would still get ten percent or about six percent year on year uh under optimal containment uh which is smaller but obviously still very sizable so to emphasize lower value of life being unreasonable you would still pursue qualitatively the same policy but to a smaller extent now the gentleman that raised the question about medical preparedness uh namely overwhelming the system this is a pretty busy graph the blue the solid blue is the model i just showed you and now you can ask, what would allowing for endogenous mortality rates do? That is to say, for allowing for the healthcare system to be uh, overwhelmed. The first thing that you want to see is that, of course, um, if I compare the red line to the blue line, you have much higher deaths, right? It's precisely that people uh, are not are overwhelming the system in the way we've parameterized it, and that translates into a, uh, a much more serious epidemic in terms of health consequences. What that also means is that you want much, much more containment because now we have two externalities. The first externality is just the infection, but the second is the externality on the medical system. And so now we have a much bigger recession or substantially bigger recession uh, once the uh, government or the, the, the planner takes us into account. Treatments is actually Martin. Uh, Martin, sorry to interrupt. Um, yes. There is a question on the first externality in Figure Three, okay. um, from Florian Heider. So, do I understand correctly that in this externality, I still work too much? But why aren't people scared and infect the externalities that I work too little? It's related to Luke's question: Is this a positive or a negative externality? Well, so let's go back to here. So let's first look at the competitive equilibrium, okay? So in the competitive equilibrium, um, a people definitely want to work less and they want to work less. But the question is how much less, right? So it's not that, you know, they definitely want to work less, but not less enough because they're only thinking, they're selfish agents, they're only thinking about the probability of they being infected but they don't think that if everybody thinks that way, right, they're not taking into account that the total amount of infected people is increasing. It just think of it as pollution. No, everyone takes the amount of pollution as given or an optimal uh, tariff argument, right? Each supplier of the good doesn't take into account that the country as a whole has some monopoly power. So it's a very classic Pagovian externality. And the answer is, yes, they want to work less, but not enough less. Does that, does that help clarify the, the, the answer? Yes, it does. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so that's medical preparedness, uh, treatments. Treatments, um, uh, the, the big difference between treatments, remember, is you're just curing infected people. I won't say much about that. It turns out that, that the competitive equilibrium isn't very sensitive to that, given how we parameterized it. And of course, you're going to want, it's, it's actually quite similar to the argument before. Treatments are, but vaccinations are important. Why are vaccinations important? So if you look at the blue line, that's the, the, the simple, simple model. And here you have vaccinations. Notice that we have a different pattern here for optimal policy. Before we had optimal policy starting off with a small tax and growing over time. But with with vaccinations, the, 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 the planners, the value of, of delaying um, uh, deaths really goes up. Because if you can just get people to, quote, behave in the short run, you know, the, the Calvo vaccine may arrive, 
and that is obviously a social good. So here, the planner starts with a very high containment tax. He really wants people to stay at home and buy time for the vaccination to arrive. So that's a different pattern than we got before. And what if you put it all together? So now take the quote, real model if you like, which is we have the medical preparedness, we have the vaccines and we have the, uh, the treatment. Optimal policy looks like a combination of the things that we've seen. You start high and then you get even bigger as the externality gets bigger. What does that mean in terms of the contraction? Well, it's a big contraction in the model. There's no question that you have a very sizable contraction in the first year. But notice that the benefits in terms of deaths, uh, you have the, the dotted line is much smaller than the solid line. So the basic argument here is if you have to do simple containment, you are, are, are going to want to have a severe contraction, unfortunately, in the first uh, um, episode, in, in, in the initial onslaught, and it actually gets bigger over time, and then you release. Let me now go to, um, ah, this is what you would do if you have a lower value of life. Notice this is the big model with the lower value of life, a similar pattern, but a less severe contraction. So you could well say that this is an overstatement of how big the contraction should be when you're calibrating, say, to the U.S. numbers. And if you go to a lower number, like 1.5 million, you would definitely want to start with containment. You will definitely want to have a recession, but it will not be as large. It's roughly 10% contraction in the first year. Okay. Um, Martin, Martin, on figure seven, uh, there's a question. Um, since you don't include heterogeneity uh, in the model in terms of young and old, but I mean, you, you basically reduce the value of life, right? But the uh, question is, um, does this imply that your policy conclusion is biased against the interest of the young? Biased again. Um, well, you want to be a little bit careful here because take, take this one over here you're basically saying that the value of life is very much skewed to well say it's skewed to younger people and because their quote lives are quote more valuable that's exactly why you want to have a big recession because you're really worried about them as you reduce the value of life and treat people as more like they're old uh you have less of a recession so paradoxically a bigger recession is to save the lives the very valuable lives of young people mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a paradox. Yeah, Let thanks. me say a few words about um, um, early exit, because, and then I'll get to smart containment. Um, we, I, I'm not a politician, but I am told that politicians uh, are keenly aware of the cost of the recession and are under substantial pressure to end containment early. We can mimic such a policy in this model and say that, look, suppose you were a politician and uh, you exited after 12 weeks. That is, that's the, uh, the, uh, the red, uh, well, here's red line is optimal containment. You're exiting after 12, you shouldn't be. The dotted line is what you, sh quote, should be doing in our simple model. Notice that what will happen are two things. Let's look first at infection. If you exit early, you will get a huge shoot up in infections relative to what you would have had had you done the optimal policy. Moreover, yes, you will get a V-shaped recovery in that initial period, but as the infection goes up and you haven't had herd containment, you're simply going to fall back into a recession again. So early exit will get you, if you like, a short-term high, and unfortunately, the cost will be more deaths ultimately and not substantial. You know, you'll get, you, you will get a little more consumption, but, but it's clearly, I don't think, worth it from the perspective of the model. This row just says the longer you can hold off the politicians, I don't want to be mean about politicians, but the longer you can hold off early exit, the better. So notice the, the red and the dotted lines are closer. So the lesson is, yeah, you can get a temporary kick, but it's, it's not socially optimal. What about starting late? Now, by the way, let me just say, if you uh, exited, say, after the peak, you would get the classic kind of pattern in the model that we saw in the Black Plague, uh, sorry, in the uh, Spanish flu. There's a lot of interesting evidence across countries that you got, you know, 
dips and then big infection rises again. And then here we just get an acceleration because of where we ended, uh, we could have ended over here and then you would have got a resurgence. This is just the cost of starting late. And all I'm gonna say about that is, if you start late, you're really gonna have to slam the economy once you start, right? If we had started earlier, we would not have had to have such severe containment policies as this red line depicts over here. Here, you're starting very late in the infection. There's a raging infection and you just have to send everybody home and the economic consequences are extremely severe. Okay, I wanna end with smart containment because I've been relentlessly gloomy and um, uh, I think we all need a little bit of uh, um, um, something to look forward to. The, 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 the problem that I just solved amounts to a, a uh, either think of it as a Ramsey problem where you have one tax instrument or a social planning problem where you impose the constraint that consumption and work for everybody is exactly the same. Let's imagine for just a moment that you had the technology and the ability for social planner who could choose consumption and hours worked for people based on their health status. To be clear, I know we don't have that, but suppose we did. I wanna call that smart containment as opposed to what we just looked at. Well, at the beginning of the epidemic, what would be the, 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 the criterion function of this planner? Well, there are no uh, recovered people, right? They're only infected and they're only susceptible people. And these are the two weights, infected and susceptible and he or she would want to maximize this, uh, this value function. Now, what are the constraints of the problem? Well, there's the transmission function, the laws of motion for the population, the lifetime utility of infected recovered people, as well as the lifetime of susceptible people. But here's the critical thing. The planner internalizes all externalities. So there's no, quote, pollution or optimal tariff externality. He or she, every time they make a decision, they internalize all the externalities. We do need to make a choice about how do we think of consumption of infected people? I'll show you two solutions. One is if you think that the infected have to go shopping. And more humanely, we're going to imagine in the second scenario that we can somehow just drop food off uh, in their homes without a danger of contagion. So first, let's look at what happens um, if you have to, um, if, if infected people go shopping uh, for themselves. The answer is we hardly have a recession at all. Look at aggregate consumption. It's tiny. It's less than one-tenth, it's what, one-tenth of one percent roughly. And why is that? What's underlying this? If you start this off early, what you do is you take the infected people and you quarantine them. That's it. Then all the recovered people are absolutely free to go work because they know the infected people are quarantined. Everybody's free to go consuming because they know the infected people are quarantined. They're not in the general population. So notice that the infection, the, 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 what's happening to the infected is, well, it's, it's, it's going down very smoothly. There's no peaks and basically they're recovering or God forbid dying. And the infection, and so total number of deaths now, these are very different numbers than we saw under either smart containment or the competitive equilibrium. Now to do this, you know, and this is almost a mathematical quirk, you would have the consumption of the infected people be very, very low. It wouldn't be zero because it's log C. So the marginal utility of consumption goes to infinity. Um, uh, and it would be quite tragic. So you can resolve the model under the assumption that yes, we can somehow get food to uh, infected people. Uh, we just, you know, somehow we, we can think of different technologies for doing that. And what would you do? Well, then basically, uh, you would, their consumption would be quite similar, a little bit lower uh, to susceptible people and infectable. It wouldn't be identical, but it would be reasonably similar, and we wouldn't be accused of being inhumane. Um, and uh, we would just say, look, you guys are infected. You have to go home. Um, until you recover or you pass away. That would be, uh, notice how dramatically that policy would uh, change the trade-off between economic costs and uh, if you like health costs measured say by deaths. Now, what's the problem with that? I mean, you're all obviously onto this. In reality, we 
have one class of tests for infected people, whether you're infected or not, a different class about whether you're covered when one person either asked or you're covered forever. Well, the recovery tests now that are being developed measure, uh, I believe it's called antigens, just how, how recovered you are. Um, and there is also the issue of type one and type two errors for the different kinds of tests. So the kinds of issues that we're raising or modeling now are allowing for people not to know their health status or there to be a test of uh, different types of alpha one and alpha two and to say, what would you do in the beginning of an infection as opposed to in the United States? Unfortunately, we're going to start off with serious testing well into the infection. Right? So the question is, would you really take, you know, suppose you started with 30% of the population infected, how would you treat that versus a very small infection when you knew for sure 1% perhaps were infected? Anyway, let me stop there and simply say uh, that there is this uh, clear trade-off with the kind of policies we're entertaining now between the cost of a recession, the health benefits, and what I take to be the hopeful point here, where we should be really focusing, perhaps um, uh, the science is building up our, our ability to test and track, which I, I gather the Germans are doing, um, and having the capacity to 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 implement uh, to implement the, the results of those tests. So I'll stop there and, and just take questions. Thank you, Martin. Um, so. Uh, there's one question from Michaela Lanza um, in the model without smart containment. So let's assume that that is still out of uh, reach for now. Um, I mean, uh, are we right to say, is it right to say that politicians who face elections soon are the most dangerous? <laughs> uh, and I mean, uh, maybe, and maybe I can add to this. Isn't there sort of another very dangerous externality outside the scope of your model. But if you think globally, isn't there an international externality? So from a so global social welfare point of view, uh, don't we need to find ways for all politicians globally to be patient? Well, I agree. I mean, I so A, I agree. I mean, I'm not a political scientist, but um, uh, clearly short termism it can be enormously costly. If, if you know, we in this country are facing an election in November, um, the closer we get to November, the close, the larger the temptations to uh, do early exit from optimal policy. Now, I, I don't know what the right way to deal with that other than to educate the public. Um, um, but it seems that the, the repercussions of that for other countries are enormous. I mean, like they you so, so you mentioned like Korea, Germany, they seem to do everything right, but it's, uh, it's uh, kind of all in vain if uh, you're the only one doing that, right? Well, it, it's certainly right that if the United States um, uh, slips into a um, uh, second uh, recession because of early exit, the repercussions, just from a strict, I, I'm not so much worried about health because the Europeans mm -hmm. can always say, look, you guys just can't come in planes. But the economic damage to Europe because yeah. of these policies on our part are undeniable. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's incredibly, you know, I'm Canadian. And uh, so uh, I live in the United States, but Canada, Pierre Elliott Trudeau once said in the 70s, when the elephant gets a cold and sneezes the most, when the elephant sneezes the most gets a cold. So that's very much true for Canadians. And uh, mm -hmm. it's not quite the right analogy for Europe, but there's no question that there will be implications for yes. Well, at least we know what to do about a call. This one is indeed <laughs> <laughs> seems more tricky. Well, Martin, um, time is up, and uh, we thank you very much for this uh, beautiful paper and great presentation. Um, a lot to chew on for all of us. And um, I, well, I, let me just say, I wish you the the best of luck, you know, both personally but as policymakers. This is an incredibly challenging time. Um, you know, both I, certainly the Fed and I, I believe the ECB have done a tremendous service in terms of liquidity and calming financial markets and uh, wise heads uh, will hopefully give wise advice to our politicians will be wise enough to take it. And that's why we reach out to you and others and we uh, indeed it's uh, it is more difficult to do this from your uh, 
home office rather than being uh, all uh, together, but uh, we are managing. Well, I look forward so, to having beer in Frankfurt with all of you in the future. 